My name is Carl Malamud. Um, I am the president of public.resource.org, and I would like to welcome you to this event about access to the law, the raw materials of our democracy. Uh, law.gov is an effort based um, in many of our major law schools, a series of workshops to examine the question of can we increase access to primary legal materials of the United States, to court opinions and briefs, to executive branch regulations, to legislative information, not only at the federal level, but in the states and in the municipalities. Uh, Abraham Lincoln in 1838 gave a speech about mob violence and the rule of despots, and he said the only way we can counter mob violence, and he was speaking specifically about a lynching in St. Louis, is by a reverence for the laws and the Constitution, and he said the laws should be in every primer, in every spelling book, in every almanac. Um, but today in the United States, it's actually very difficult sometimes to access legal materials. And the purpose of Law.gov is to examine the implications of broader access, to ask uh, what are the privacy implications, what are the financial implications, what are the implications for innovation and justice. Um, and so today we're very pleased to be here on Capitol Hill at the Committee for House Administration. Um, we have uh, two very distinguished speakers that will open up this event. Uh, the first is Congresswoman Law. Um, who is vice chair of the Committee on House Administration. Uh, the Committee on House Administration, of course, has oversight of the Library of Congress, which includes the Law Library of Congress, the largest law library in the world. So it's very appropriate that we're here in this hearing room. Uh, Congresswoman Lofgren is a longtime representative of Silicon Valley. And Law.gov is as much about innovation as it is about justice. It's about business being able to build on top of legal materials and create value-added services. She's a longtime advocate of, of open government and access to government and a member of the Judiciary Committee. Um, also here, and we're very pleased to have Congressman Lundgren, um, who is also on the Judiciary Committee. He is the ranking member of the Committee on House Administration. He is a uh, former Attorney General of the State of California, and as a um, longtime advocate for justice and the rule of law, um, the former Chief Law Enforcement Officer of the State of California, um, he is also able to address these issues in, in a, a really meaningful Way. So I'm very pleased that they're both here. Um, after we hear from the two members of Congress who may have to leave to attend to their other duties, as you know, this is the last week before uh, the break. Um, after that, we have a panel that I'll, I'll introduce, but right now I'd like to turn it over to Congresswoman Lofgren. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much, Carl, and to uh, the participants here in our hearing room as well as our online uh, participants, I think this is a very important step forward uh, in the quest to make the law accessible uh, to all. Who owns the law? Americans do. And uh, in order to fully exercise their ownership rights, uh, they need to have access not only to the legislative branch, but to the judicial branch. And I think that seems quite obvious. I'm glad to be here with my colleague Dan Lundgren. We have often collaborated on law library issues. Uh, we also both serve on the, uh, the Joint Committee with oversight over the Library of Congress, and it seems to me that the Library of Congress, really the biggest library in the world, is a good place to start with law.gov. Now, having said that the law needs to be accessible to all, uh, and as a bedrock principle, I believe that's true. Obviously, there are issues that need to be flushed out and then addressed as we move forward on this effort. Um, someone earlier, as we were talking, waiting for the uh, beginning of this uh, uh, session, said, you know, it's, it's sort of practical privacy. When you've got material, social security numbers, other matters that are in paper filings, they're really not accessible. You have to go down to the courthouse and get them. But if they're online, there's a privacy issue that is pretty big. And so we need to deal with that. How do you protect the privacy of individuals while still ga gaining access to the law? And I think it may, in the end, uh, result in a change of judicial behavior in terms of privacy and the like. So this is a very important uh, session here in Washington. I know that Carl's going around the United States to get 
uh, smart people thinking of what are the barriers, how do we address them, how do we overcome them, and that's the best way to achieve our goal, which is to make sure that the primary documents of the law are available to all. So thank you very much, Carl and everyone else, and uh, my colleague Dan uh, Lundgren has already uh, been introduced, so maybe I can just ask Dan to come up and welcome you as well, and thank you very much for your interest and your help in this effort. Dan. Thanks very much. So uh, when we were in this uh, room last, which was last Thursday before we adjourned, we were having a markup of a bill and for some reason the chairman had difficulty distinguishing between Lofgren and Lundgren. Um, <laughs> but that is old Lofgren. I'm Dan Lundgren. If you look up on the board that shows how we vote, you'll notice for some reason most people just have uh, their name without a uh, middle name in it and mine is Daniel E. Lundgren. And I asked why they put it up there, and they said that's to distinguish you from Zoe Lofgren so that there is no error. <laughs> so we're very careful around this place. And uh, also, thank you very much, Carl. I, um, you know, about the sixth time you said long standing, I wondered if I needed to bring a wheelchair or something up here. Uh, both Zoe and I started very, very young. So uh, even though we're long standing, uh, we are still hopefully vigorous. Uh, I'll, tr I'll try to be brief which is always strange for people coming from the law profession whose um, ponderous documents uh, when filed with the courts are known as our briefs, but I will try to be brief. In the uh, cacophony of uh, voices in our culture, I don't think there's any doubt that law is um, so important and often helps us rise above that cacophony. You know, you think of the Magna Carta, you think of uh, the U.S. Constitution, uh, the Reconstruction Amendments, uh, the Civil Rights Acts, um, the Geneva Conventions, Nuremberg Trials, um, Universal uh, Declaration of Human Rights. They form the legal architecture of our culture, of our, um, the way in which we go about uh, ordering our lives to some great extent. They enshrine some of our most uh, cherished principles. Uh, they talk about the value of life, the freedom of conscience, uh, religious uh, freedom. The founders had a phrase uh, it, in, when, in which they said, the law is king. And that's uh, sort of an extraordinary uh, sense if you think about it. Um, it is the idea that we have non-arbitrary law. Uh, we are a country of laws, not of men, in a very real sense. And you can thank our greatest jurists for their contributions uh, to the law. Blackstone, the framers, uh, Justice Marshall, uh, Justice Harlan. I have to confess I've not always enjoyed uh, the study of the law, particularly with some of my semesters uh, in law school. Uh, perhaps uh, those were the uh, times when I least enjoyed the study of the law. But even there, and in Congress on the Judiciary Committee, when I was privileged to serve as Attorney General of my state, and in the one opportunity I had to argue a case before the United States Supreme Court, I've come to have a, a deep and abiding appreciation for our legal history and a dedication to the laws and its perpetuation. Um, this is important. I, I love uh, the uh, title, The Raw Materials of Our Democracy, Broader Access to Primary Legal Materials in the United States. It might scare some people if they read that title. It basically means allowing people an opportunity to read those documents that are so fundamental. I am one of those who uh, has, for a long period of time, argued that the Supreme Court is wrong when they don't allow televising of their deliberations. I can understand why we don't allow it in some circumstances in trials uh, because of undue influence uh, or the undue impact on witnesses and perhaps jurors. But I find really no relevant argument against televising the deliberations of the Supreme Court. Because in some ways, uh, what happens, in my judgment, is it reminds me of uh, that famous movie which ends with the wizard being behind the screen. And when we make it so difficult to access those who are the final arbiters, if you will, of uh, issues engaged in the law, it creates an artificial mysteriousness that I think is not helpful. 
I think we ought to have greater access. The idea that only people steeped in the law can understand the Constitution because the words are so technical or uh, what they say is not what they mean, to me, is an absurdity. And to the extent that we can gra grant greater access to the raw materials of our democracy so that people can read them for themselves and attempt to understand them um, with the meaning of the words found there, I think the better off we're going to be. So I, for one, uh, view this as a, an interesting uh, argument, interesting subject matter, and uh, I will be working along with Zoe and others to ensure that we do have greater access to these uh, fundamental uh, materials of our democracy. And uh, in that process, I will still work to encourage the Supreme Court to see the wisdom of uh, my ideas. It's much easier for me to say that from here than when I was um, at the podium uh, appearing before the members of the court. Uh, that is an interesting experience because they tell you that when the light goes off, you are to stop in mid-sentence, uh, if not mid-word or mid-syllable, unless you are addressing a specific question of the court. And I remember when I was preparing for my argument, I was observing some of the arguments that went before me. And about a month before I argued, there was a member of the bar arguing and a question was presented to him about a case with which he was obviously not familiar because uh, the court, one of the members of the court said to him, not the Chief Justice, uh, and how do you believe that uh, such and such case um, is relevant to this? Or, 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 or how, do you, how do you interpret such and such case? And this fellow stopped for a minute and he thought and he finally said, well, for purposes of the matter before this court, we really don't have to know how that decision was decided. <laughs> At which point in time, uh, Chief Justice uh, Rehnquist looked up and said to him, counsel, maybe we don't, but you do. <laughs> um, as I say, it's easier for me to make suggestions uh, about the court from here than it was from there. Uh, but once again, we all should be working with our eyes glued on those raw materials of our democracy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Congressman. That was, that was good. Um, Robert uh, Oakley was the distinguished uh, law librarian of Georgetown, past president of the American Association of Law Libraries. And he told me once that cameras in the Supreme Court was not about courtroom TV, and it wasn't even about C-SPAN bringing their cameras in. It was about law students all over the country being able to see the best lawyers in the country arguing at the height of their career. And it was about legal education. It was about making sure that the, the kid at Indiana University had the same access to view those arguments as, as the kid at Georgetown. Um, and that, that was one of his big issues that he was working on. Um, I'd like to ask our panel to come up, please, and we're going to do the next section of this program. Thank you very much, Congressman.